from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's not often a critic gets to meet and interview an author whose books he or she has reviewed. So it's really a great pleasure for me to finally meet Orhan Pamuk, whose work I have long admired and whose most recent novel, The Museum of Innocence, I reviewed for the Washington Post last year. You will know Orhan Pamuk, of course, for the long trail of literary excellence that precedes him. He is the author of such original, widely translated, and much lauded novels as My Name is Red and Snow, as well as the memoir Istanbul. Four years ago, in 2006, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Now, as we all know, it's a much touted precept that once a Nobel Prize is awarded, the laureate has a hard time ever producing a great work again. <laughs> After that prize of that magnitude, the writer can lose, shall we say, his knees, his chops, his pen. But with the Museum of Innocence, Pamuk has proved that his place in the literary pantheon is secure. The novel, which has just been reissued in paperback, and I think you can uh, buy today, or already have bought, I hope, at his signing, is a brave, inventive, devilishly entertaining novel, the work of a writer in total control of his craft. Mr. Pamuk was born 58 years ago in Istanbul, the grandson of a prominent Turkish engineer who owned factories and built railroads. As a child, he longed to be a painter and I had the wonderful experience of walking through the National Museum of Art with him just now. And uh, it, it, he's back to painting, he says, like a teenager. Uh, as a young man, though, he followed the family tradition and studied engineering and architecture and then took a sharp turn and earned a degree in journalism. But he didn't use any of these. He never practiced any of these disciplines. Until the age of 30, he lived in his mother's apartment in Istanbul writing, as we say, for the desk drawer, producing works that for one reason or other he wouldn't or couldn't get published. When his first book, Sevdet Bey, is that how you pronounce it? Chevdet, yes. Chevdet, Chevdet Bey, and his sons was finally published in 1982 when he was still a young man. It was likened to Thomas Mann's Buddenbrooks and won Turkey's prestigious Orhan Kemal Prize. His second, The Silent House, a novel about a family told through many narrators, suggested, according to John Updike, Virginia Woolf and William Faulkner. His third, The White Castle, a creepy 17th century tale of double identity, evoked comparison to Jorge Luis Borges and Italo Calvino. The fourth, The Black Book, a missing person's adventure that reveled in the details of Istanbul, was fashioned after James Joyce's Ulysses. The fifth, The New Life, a dreamlike first-person contemporary tale, was described by a reviewer as Kafka with a light touch. <laughs> the sixth, My Name is Red, a murder mystery set in 16th century Istanbul, used the art of miniature illumination to explore a nation's soul. Since then, he has written the books we as Americans know best, the disturbing Snow, which he described as my first and last political novel, describes a poet who returns to the sectarian violence and tension of Istanbul after being away for many years. Istanbul, his memoir, is a stirring tribute to the city of his ancestors, the streets and haunts of his youth. In all, Orhan Pamuk's great skill is his ability to reinvent himself in book after book, and yet, like a magician manipulating boxes, each book contains something of the next, a narrator, a character, a distinct little helix of DNA that creates the illusion of a coherent universe. And that larger Pamukian universe describes a people and a nation struggling between worlds, between old and new, between East and West, between Asia and Europe, between fundamentalism and tolerance, between provincialism and globalization, between the strange and the familiar. He has been, for many readers, an eloquent bridge between many antipodes. 
His book has, books have been enormously successful. They've been translated into 60 languages, including Catalan and Bahasa Melayu. They've received uncountable prizes and honors. Four years ago, Time Magazine called him one of the most 100 influential, most influential persons in the world. We're lucky to have him here with today <laughs> to talk about his life and work. He's also obviously very, um, uh, not a show-off at all. <laughs> uh, we're lucky to have him here to talk about his life and work. Please welcome this very special guest, Orhan Pamuk. Thank you so much. I don't know what to say after all this. Any mistake you make is enlarged and enlarged and enlarged. So I have to keep on the line of being modest and try to do my best in a modest fashion, try to answer the questions. I hope the questions are not too hard, by the way. <laughs> well, let's start with a, can you hear me with this? Let's start with a concrete fact. Yes, you can hear me. You left your science education behind, Orhan, to be a novelist. Tell us about your decision to abandon all that elaborate education in engineering and architecture, not to mention journalism, to hole up at the age of 23 to become a writer. Um, um, there, is some, there was some family ideology behind it. I come from a family of engineers. My grandfather was one of the first civil engineers in Turkey who made a lot of money building railroads. My father, my, one of my uncles, went to the same school, Istanbul Technical University, again to study civil engineering. And the, in the family, um, um, the, uh, the atmosphere, the talk, the rhetoric was all, you don't, want, you don't go to business, you don't go to arts, you don't go to this, you don't go to that, you be an engineer. Also, this is sprinkled with the idea that Turkey is a poor country. Engineers are making and developing and building buildings. So, my grandson, you have to do that. While, on the other hand, I was a sort of a, in a family of engineers and people who were very good in mathematics. Um, I was also interested in arts, and I was considered a sort of a black sheep in that manner. So, as I was... Um, Draw, um, painting, as you have just um, said, someone in the family said, oh, this one, now that he will, of course, uh, inevitably be an engineer and then likes to paint, why don't he be an architect? So I en enrolled to the <laughs> same Istanbul Technical University architectural school. But at the third grade, I realized that I just don't want to be both an architect and a painter. I quit studying architecture, enrolled to the School of uh, Journalism, not to be a journalist, but just to delay my military service, <laughs> and begin writing my first novel. Right, right. Well, re-engineering, um, you had said in other colors, I think. When I think of a writer, I think of a person who locks himself up in a room and patiently constructs stories, just as a mason constructs bridges with stones. It reminds me of an essay, uh, an essay that I love by John Gregory Dunn called Laying Pipe, in which he says that writing is manual labor of the mind. It's a job like any other job. You lay pipe, you write. Um, is writing a craft like any other? It is a craft like any other, and craftsmanship <laughs> side of it is neglected. The modernist ideology puts the writer the create, and the painter and the creative artist on a pedestal and under stresses his ingenuity, his uniqueness, or his or her, um, um, or um, the way they are constituted different from the rest of us. This is a modernist um, ideology. Also, we owe some of this to the history of art history where um, attribution to single artists made the value of the paintings went go, uh, go up. So um, his signature, artist's style, his uniqueness, yes, we believe in these things, but in modernity they are a bit exaggerated. Um, with that I mean that as a writer I am not a great, crazy, creative, genius artist all the time. 
most of my time is, in fact, turning around sentences. And learning is about craftsmanship, things they perhaps try to teach the students in creative uh, writing departments. Um, since that part of, uh, of um, craftsmanship, part of writing is neglected, writers, yes, gained a, an aura of distinct personalities, but then most of the people do not realize how much very simple craftsman-like labor goes into writing a novel. When the novel is good, when you enjoy it, when you say, wow, he is a genius, this author, you don't realize also, and I also, as a reader, sometimes I even forget that how, how many times this author turns around sentences, um, builds up things, maneuvers, he spends a month actually not at doing many genius-like composition, but turning things around, developing ideas. But then, yes, in the end, we call um, um, the Renaissance painters we love so much, they were also craftsmen and artists. Our modern idea of the artist put the artist too much on the pedestal, and, and it, he, it he or she should come down. And this was the idea behind My Name is Red, one of the ideas behind mm -hmm. one of my novels, My Name is Red, which is about painters. Mm. So speaking of craftsmanship and the discipline that goes into your art, I read somewhere that you write, and I don't know that you have the schedule anymore, but that you write from 2 to 8 in the afternoon. You take a break, and then you write again from midnight to 4 in the morning. This was years, years ago, before my daughter was born. <laughs> and now she is, imagine, is a student at Columbia University. Where, okay, once in a week, I also teach at Columbia University. Twice a week, we have a lunch and chat, and she says, Daddy, come to this class. There's so much art, art history there, so forth and so on. Um, um, but then after she was born, then I switched the whole program. Uh, I like, and I think most of authors that I like also like working till 4 a.m. in the morning. Dostoevsky used to work till 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and will sleep at that time and wake up 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, whatever. I, lived 20 years like that, and this, in this next 20 years, and I mean, my daughter probably born in the middle of my uh, writing career, I have changed it. Now I wake up very early. This changed because when she, uh, she was born, we are taking care of her. Then later, I used to take her to school every morning and go to the office. So, but why do writers like to work in the middle of the night? It simply is this, that uh, you know, I lived all my life in Istanbul. It's a city of 10 million. 10 million people are sleeping. You are, you are the only one who is awake. And that brings some urgency, importance, and creativity. That you have something to say. They're sleeping. It's as if you're preparing a newspaper. They're sleeping, but you're doing something very special. Now, you're speaking about your daughter reminds me of something that he said to me earlier today, which absolutely I found so charming. He said that, uh, well, tell us about uh, what your daughter made you do when, you, when she was a little girl and you were putting her to bed at night and uh, her, oh, your storytelling. OK, uh, Maria <laughs> is mentioning this because we were walking across these tents and there was a children's books tent. And oh, um, I am, oh, oh, this is some Jane Smiley, I think. I didn't know that Jane Smiley wrote children's books. And I thought, hmm. Uh, Maybe I should also publish my children's books. <laughs> um, um, I am the kind of author who always is jealous of other authors. <laughs> uh, my idea Common. of influence is this, that I go to a bookshop, I look at a book which I haven't read, and look at the cover and the success or whatever, an interesting book, and I begin to project my idea of that book. I haven't read that book. I think and think and think so much about that book, uh, which I have never read. I don't know what it's about. But I <laughs> fancy about that book. And I am later influenced by, from my fancy of that book. Uh, so I saw uh, that Jane Smiley is doing some children's book thing. And I, then 
I mentioned to Maria that, in fact, when my daughter was uh, a, a small baby or till she was 10 or 11, every Saturday I used to tell her stories. At 11 o'clock she would come to my bed and for two hours, three hours, I would tell her stories. Then, and then after a while, I, I, in a business-like fashion, I begin to record these stories. But the funny thing about these stories, she would, in the middle of uh, um, each Saturday, before each session started, she would say, uh, okay, I want the witch, I want the bird, I want this, <laughs> but no killing of that, no... <laughs> then I would immediately give her the story. <laughs> Arhan, tell us what was the inspiration for your first book, Chemdet Bey and his sons? It was really, um, 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 well, it was not, oh, I have such an important story to tell and I have to write it. It was not like this. That uh, for me, it, and I think I have seen from so many writers' autobiographies, biographies from my writer friends, that first you want to be a writer, then you think of the novel. It's not like the other way around. First, you have such an important story to tell, uh, and then you write a novel. It was not like me. First, I wanted to be a writer, and it, this is associated, closely linked with the idea that I wanted to be a painter, imagining myself alone in a room, spending a whole life. Now, the idea of painting failed, but this time I wanted to write a book. Then it's very natural that my first book, which I hope that it will be one day translated here, perhaps five or six years later, is a family saga, which is all based on my per, uh, per family. So it's a 600 page of family seg, uh, story of my family. It's, in that sense, it's like wood and books. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Indeed. Now, so many of your books, and this really, um, we'll talk about Museum of Innocence in a, in a moment, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, this really struck me in snow the fact that so many of your books are like puzzles within puzzles. They're like Chinese boxes. They have constructions in them that um, are, for instance, well, in Snow, uh, the narrator's name is Ka, right? He is headed for the town of Kars. And in Turkish, the word for snow is Kar. Now, are these deliberate Borgesian boxes, uh, or are you, are critics just chasing their tails when they try to find them, or? Okay. Tell uh, us about that. They, uh, um, they are, yes, little Borgesian tricks, but they are not Borgesian in the sense that for Borges, um, this kind of trick was everything. For me, they are lesser. The fact that I, they also ask me so frequently, well, Mr. Pamuk, in the end of your novel, Snow or Museum of Innocence, I come across you. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's not so important, really. Um, that uh, my appearance or this, these kind of jokes are ornamental rather than essential to the philosophy or uh, um, to the essential um, nature of the book. I make these jokes, there are so many personal jokes, this or that, if you miss them, and I'm sure so many readers misses them, and they're because there are so many, you don't, you just miss them. It's not that you miss the book, you don't, you misunderstand the book. A book, my books, or a good books are layers of layers of layers of meaning. Some of them personal, even you understand. Some of them, even you forget that personal little joke because it happens, something happens in the bus. So, um, but in the, uh, but uh, in the long run, um, um, those little games, elaborations are, for me, yes, they are not the essential thing. Essential thing is what is invented in 19th century. 19th century novel, I think, is still dominating. We may call ourselves postmodernist, modernist, experimental, this or that, but what makes the reader grasp what makes the train moving, the force, the energy, the narrative drive comes from the, those essential structures invented by Dickens, by Balzac, by Stendhal, it's, and, by, and continued mm -hmm. after that. Uh, speaking of structures, um, let's talk about building bridges. Is Turkey, in fact, a bridge between the East and the West? 
or does that representation diminish the unique personality and character of the Turkey country? Turkey made it first. There are so many layers. There is a rhetoric so many times repeated, oh, you're from, from Turkey, it's a bridge from between East and West, which is true, look at the map, it's like that. Um, it's a Muslim country, aspires to be European, part of European Union. Its whole history is formed by these clashes, inner clashes, those in the nation who resist Western influence and those who won. This is the nature of Turkey, and I belong to that culture, of course, obviously so. But then, this has, doesn't have too much to do with my writing. Though, as a Turkish writer, I tackle questions of, uh, questions of identity, the weight of history, and the desire to embrace modernity, the clashes in the culture, in the, and of course, there is always a class side, um, um, rich and the poor side to westernization. Like many countries, in Turkey too, upper classes, ruling classes, richer people you know, want westernization and European more than the rest of the nation. So, and there are so many problems related to this. I tackle, address, represent, dramatize, go, go into, embrace, play around with all these problems, but am I a bridge between East and West? No. <laughs> but they say so. Ah, uh, um, well, there is a wonder, you know, speaking of westernization, um, which uh, I think Orhan writes about brilliantly, there's this wonderful scene in Museum of Innocence uh, of the wedding in the Istanbul Hilton. Now, the black market liquor is flowing, the women are wearing mini skirts, the men are hip and wise to the world, and they're swinging through the revolving doors. But you know that we can qu quickly forget that we are in a Muslim country. And um, tell us about your grappling with that aspect of the character of the country, specifically in Museum of Innocence. Well, look, look but, uh, um, uh, just not to get the impression uh, uh, in Turkey, just till recently, alcohol was produced by the government and was a, a government monopoly. So just to say that it's a Muslim country doesn't mean that people don't drink there less than, you know, uh, Germans or Russians. Uh, <laughs> Turks enjoy drinking and, uh, and government produces, uh, um, till recently, rakı. Uh, the national drink. Um, once um, there is a lot of exaggerated idea of Islam, of course, because of the, what happened in the last 10 years, and once the idea of, or general uh, idea of cliche of is Islam is exaggerated, I am facing these questions about do people drink in Turkey? Do this happen? Do that happen? And more or less, I think, uh, the average income per capita is also increasing. Turkey, as a country, is uh, closely, slowly approaching European standards. Yes, on the other hand, it is an Islamic country. Yes, there, on the other hand, there are politically motivated people who don't want you to drink alcohol in that country. And there are clashes, but those clashes are small. They are played in the democratic arena. Or, or in the constitutional arena, and everything is working fine, that there is not, the country is not falling apart. Mm. You, as you've just uh, indicated, you've always been bold and unafraid to say what you think and what you believe, and you were charged, actually, as a criminal in Istanbul in 2005 for saying in a Swiss publication that 30,000 Kurds had been killed in Turkey as well as one million Armenians. Um, I read somewhere also that in, you were the first person in Turkey to defend Salman Rushdie after the publication of Satanic Verses, which, as we know, infuriated the Ayatollah Khomeini and brought a fatwa down on Rushdie's head. Why have you chosen to speak out about Turkey's difficult history, or is it just something that, is you, that you can't help but do? I mean, is this yeah, a choice? Yeah, on look, your um, um, I don't want to pose as more brave as I am, more than, um, you know, I'm not that brave, but th uh, <laughs> things happen. Also, things happen to a, a, what I will say, 
you know, the uh, uh, words change. Um, uh, so a writer, if you come from a third world, or I would say more politely, so a writer who comes from a troubled parts of the world, poor parts of the world, or non-Western world, where free speech is troubled, and unfortunately fr free speech is still troubled in Turkey, journalists, both inside and outside of Turkey, naturally ask you, well, Mr. Pamuk, I think uh, you write a novel of love, very good, but what do you think of the government? Uh, so, either you back away from that question, or you honestly tell what you think. Then, it is inevitable you end up being a political commentator, no matter how willing you are in it, and how you are not. Then, your dignity, your representation of yourself, your picture of yourself is at stake too. You can't say, uh, well, just don't ask me about government, okay? Just keep that. You just don't want it. You, and and I'm, I'm, I'm also a sometimes ill-tempered person, losing my, you know, uh, and then I, tell, I say whatever I want to say. Uh, while, and that also puts me in trouble. I go to court, my friends shall tell me, shut up. My, um, I have bodyguards in Turkey when I go out in the streets, so forth and so on. But on the other hand, I don't want to pose as a brave political person because I am not. I am a brave writer in aesthetics, venturing, doing bravest things if I want to be brave. In my novels, and I'm not saying political things, but turning around the art of the novel rather than. But on the other hand, yes, there were situations when I think I have to say what I have to say, and I said them, but. I don't want to be my, that kind of politics to be my life. It's such a tender thing, you know. You spend six years, say, you write Museum of Innocence, you know, this joke happened to me. And then it's about love, there is politics in it, but that's not that important. My text is important. Then the first thing is that what a great love novel, Mr. Pomuk, but what do you think about <laughs> bombing in there someplace, you know? Right. And you have to answer that. So, that, uh, Politics um, is inevitable for a non-Western writer. Um, it is hard to maneuver with dignity, uh, um, protecting your artistic integrity and also your personal, ethical, political integrity to combine these two. I have, I've been sweating and sweating and it's not only Washington heat. It is, <laughs> uh, it is a situation that I have to endure and learn to master. Mm. And you do. <laughs> now, let's talk, Orhan, about your book, Museum of Innocence, which is an absolutely, astoundingly wonderful book. Um, it is a love story. It is a surprising love story. It's a story of a man who is besotted in love with a young woman and continues to be besotted in love with her all his life. Uh, whether he, he can't leave her, he can't have her, um, it is at once uh, a, um, a trap and at also the it turns out to be the inspiration of our hero's life. Um, I am also I am very entertained by the fact that you've given your hero the name of the prize that you won, the Orhan Kemal. Of course, Orhan Kemal was a, a great Turkish writer, uh, but that is the name of our hero in the story of this besotted uh, suitor. So tell us, if you would, how this story came to you and how you constructed it and what you're trying to do. Really, it's so hard I, I, um, to um, um, plot out one by one to remember how the details of a whole novel come to you. A novel, for me, we can, in our mind's eye, in our imagination, picture a novel as a big, big oak tree, so to speak, in which there are millions, tens of thousands of leaves. No author can in any moment of inspiration can dream all of these uh, um, leaves once. Um, for me, artistic literary creation is a matter of patience, slowly and slowly. 
leaf by leaf, you invent a novel. Yes, you have instincts and experience. You think, well, the boat should go this way, the wind come, may come from this way, no one had gone that way, why don't I go this way then? You more or less uh, plot your where you want to head, these are your themes, your subjects, things you know, things you want to identify with, some of the things you don't know but you want to learn and you want to put in a book, these are all make a whole package and you sail. But you have a sense of experience, sense of drama, sense of mystery and expectation, and, not, and on your way, leaf by leaf, you invent a tree. There is not a single day you said, I was one day sitting under a tree and an apple fall on my head and I wrote that novel. Don't believe that. <laughs> uh, but yes, the beginnings of novels are like that. I was sitting in a, under a tree and I thought, well, why don't I write a novel about a man so obsessed with love that his whole life is destroyed? It will be a good excuse to write about once and last time about the Istanbul bourgeoisie I know, and also class distinctions, also repression of women. Also, um, I like museums and collectors. Who is a collector? Why do people collect things? What makes a person a collector and what makes a collection a, a, a museum? So forth and so on. And also the power of objects to bring us the past interesting moments. Also another idea I have in, uh, is that how objects remind us of past moments. Maybe I can illustrate this with this little story. We go to a movie. Um, we, with a coat, and we just leave the movie, put the ticket in our coat pocket. We don't use that coat for 10 years. It's someplace, then say 20 years later, someone says, oh, I found your old coat. You're not using this anyway. Um, shall I throw this? Oh, by the way, I found this ticket, and gives you that ticket. Now, once you touch that ticket, the movie, you immediately realize, oh yes, I went to that movie. You have already forgotten that you have seen that movie, but now with the ticket you remember not only the movie, that you saw that movie, scenes of that, that movie that you have forgotten begin to come back to you. That is the power of the object. But then, I'm not the first one who thought of this. It was Marcel Proust who thought of this idea. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I gave you a different example. This is my Madeleine. <laughs> yes. Now, um, Orhan is very invested in this whole notion because he is building a museum. Actually, he's about to open a museum in Istanbul. Tell us a little bit about that. Wow, okay. Now, I wrote a novel called Museum of an Innocence, co uh, chronicle, chronicling a man's infatuation, if the word is right, to a, uh, to a twice removed cousin. He is an upper class rich guy. Twice removed cousin is a poor tailor's daughter. This happens, that happens, I won't tell you what. And then, uh, in the end, the girl, like Turkish melodramas, uh, marries someone else. The guy is not happy, visits the poor girl's family for eight years, and collects whatever she touches because that helps, um, uh, helps him um, um, addresses his what we call love pain. Then this happens, that happens, he tries to um, erect build a museum of innocence with the objects he collected. The novel chronicles all of this, all the rules of the museum, what you have to wear in the museum, how many people can, uh, can enter. And in fact, the story is also told as a sort of a um, annotated mu um, museum um, catalog. You know, we buy a museum catalog, we see, what do we see? We see say a photo of this pencil and it says this is a black pencil when my beloved was looking at me very meaningfully she was also holding this and we can talk and talk and talk and like this let us imagine in our mind's eye to compose a novel in the shape of an annotated detailed and de annotated in a very detailed fashion more or less the museum of innocence the novel is formed and made like this and i'm also 
doing the museum in Istanbul because as I wrote the novel, I bought all the objects that are mentioned in the novel. Um, a good example can be is what the characters wear. Um, I bought what they wore and then described them you know, looking at the you know, uh, dress and put them in a book. Now I'm going to put them in a museum, as simple as this. <laughs> it's charming. I hope you get a lot of, a lot of visitors to your museum, Orhan. Now, I, I want you to get ready to ask your questions, but I want to read. If you ha here is a homework assignment. If you have not read the Orhan Pamuk's Nobel Prize speech, please go home, pull it up on the internet, and read it. It is an extraordinarily moving account of the weight of his father's briefcase, a marvelous, marvelous piece. I want to read just a paragraph from it. Actually, will you read it? I'm not ready. OK, I'll do my best. Thank you. OK, I am now going to speak of this weight's meaning. Um, when we say this weight, it was the weight of my father's suitcase. It was full of his manuscripts. His, he considered himself an unsuccessful author. Let me add, he didn't try too much. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, you know, after me, maybe you want to publish these things, and gave me his manuscripts just, uh, sometime before he died. Then I, in my Nobel lecture, I will refer to that the weight of that suitcase was, in fact, the weight of literature. I am now going to speak of this weight's meaning. It is what a person creates when he shuts himself up in a room, sits down at a table, and retires to a corner to express his thoughts. That is the meaning of literature. The writer's secret is not inspiration, for it is never clear where it comes from. It is his stubbornness, his patience. I wrote that. I agree. <laughs> uh, that lovely Turkish saying, to dig a well with a needle, seems to me to have been said with writers in mind. In the old stories, I love the patience of Ferhat, who digs through mountains for his love. And I understand it, too. In my novel, My Name is Red, and I wrote about the old Persian miniaturists who had drawn the same horse with the same passion for so many years, memorizing each stroke that they could recreate that beautiful horse. Even with their eyes closed, I knew I was talking about the writing profession and my own life. If a writer is to tell his own story, tell it slowly and as if it were a story about other people. If he is to feel the power of the story rise up inside him, if he is to sit down at a table and patiently give himself over to this art, this craft, he must first have been given some hope. Thank you so much. Well, I feel that Orhan gives you as much hope about literature as he gives me. And I know you will have very interesting questions for him. Please step up to the microphone now and um, make it good. <laughs> I'm just wondering, when you were arrested in Turkey, I'm assuming that you were just out on bail, not actually jailed. Is that correct? No. You were jailed. Oh, no, you weren't. All right, I'm wondering if you think that charges were dropped due to your international reputation, or do you think someone just had second thoughts on these charges? Some of the charges were dropped because of my international reputation. Some of the court cases are continuing, by the way, but I'm trying to. Um, I don't want to dramatize that. Over here. Hi. I wonder if you could address another craft, translation, Sorry? and the extent to which you were involved with the translators in 58 languages of your works. The only language in which I think I have some command of is English, and I'm, I only check the English translations, uh, translations. I have worked a lot, a lot with my translators. 
fighting with them, arguing with them, being their friends, talking with them, understanding, correcting, discussing, listening. Uh, um, you just can't say this in English and uh, answers all the time. Um, and, I, and since um, English is the only language I check, I, I cannot stop myself. And I'm, I'm translated to my, uh, almost 60 languages. Say of this, some um, now it's decreasing. But some ten years ago, maybe some twenty of them was translated through English. Say I'm translated to Vietnamese, uh, even to Swedish through. Not now, but fifteen years ago, my first book was translated to Swedish through English. So of course, I deliberately I cared about the quality, precision music of translation as much as I can. That of first time consuming. It's a lot of energy with a dedicated person. You are never rich if you're a translator. That person obviously cares about your work. She is very, he or she is very respectful and wants to help you while you begin to criticize. This is not like that. I didn't mean that. You got it all wrong. Where is my music? <laughs> and, this, um, and this person loves you, wants to give you in other language how to say it, and you know, dramas, m tears, and all that. Uh, don't ask me too much. <laughs> he has a wonderful translator, by the way, Maureen Freely, who is a writer in her oh, own right. And all I of my it. translators are there, all wonderful. Oh, <laughs> all wonderful. He says he's not political, right? <laughs> Next one, please. You've partially answered my question, but you talked about the craft of writing and how you work and rework your sentences. And I'm wondering, with a translation, when I read the English translation, what might I be missing? Of course, translation is missing something that the customs of languages, in the customs, some things unfortunately stay. But then I say, well, that stayed there. Let's invent something else in the, in the translated language. Translation is, of course, betrayal. But then, on the other hand, the, the, for me, the definition of prose is that is something that is translatable. That if I'm writing a novel, I am naively believing that whatever I put there is translatable. Uh, except that I'm not, if I'm not aspiring to write Finnegan's Wake, every novel is translatable. Yes, some of it, some of the meaning is lost, but there, if you have a good translator you work with, some, something is gained too. Thank you. Over here, please. Mr. Pahamuk, I was just wondering about the bourgeoisie. You mentioned the Victorian novel. Do you think that uh, the class that you talk about, the bourgeoisie in Turkey, the decaying elite, um, what happens when you find the newer hordes that are arriving in Turkey? Like, you what, know, what, happened? what happens when the newer classes, that uh, you know, the people who are making their money, the diaspora, what happens when they come onto the scene? We haven't seen much of them except for in snow. I see. Yes, of course. If the, um, the, um, the logic of having rich bourgeoisie is there will be nouveau rich bourgeoisie and they will change. Um, I don't think that we should ascribe to the idea that the old bourgeoisie was better, the new ones are vulgar, is a cliche as you know, and cliches has also some reality into them too. Mm -hmm. That's what it is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are we here? Hi, I wrote my question down actually because it's a little long, so I hope you'll, you'll bear with me. But I remember reading something that you wrote about A Thousand and One Nights where you said that you had read it at different times in your life. It meant different things to you at different stages. But that as a work, it was really a collaboration of East and West and that it, it started in the East, went through Europe, was shaped by Europe before it came back to you in Istanbul. And I was wondering if you think that because of real or perceived political tension between the West and the broader Middle East, or even things like technological advances, that we've lost the opportunity for such broad cultural and literary collaborations between the East and the West? I don't think that we, don't, we lost that opportunity, that the cultures are there in its, their richness. And uh, let's not confuse um, pol uh, recent political developments with uh, cultural in exchange, interchange, 
culture, even if there's a war going on, cultural interchange and exchange go, uh, continues too. Even when they fight, say, in medieval times, they fought, then they, um, by the side, they remarry marry to each other, this and that. It is inevitable that cultures inter, um, interchange, influence each other. I don't, um, I'm not regretful about, oh, Oh, Middle Eastern culture, they, we were going to influence West so much, but we lost some opportunity? No. Uh, in fact, um, um, now that we're talking about Arabian Nights, the, um, this essay that you're talking about, which was published in other colors, was my a sort a, an introduction to a new translation of Arabian Nights to Turkish. I wrote it saying that, perhaps to uh, make it my points clearer, that in my childhood, I read Arabian Nights abridged translations for t Turkish boys, and I read them as a Western. My God, look at these fancy, uh, um, strange Arabs. What's happening to them? Like a European reader. But on the other hand, um, Arabian Nights, and some of, some of the stories like Aladdin and, um, and the Jinn story is a European invention. It's not an Arabic story. It's not a Middle Eastern story. So books are always made up of palimpsests, so many layers. Uh, we should not hastily combine political aspirations, political utopias with, with books and culture so fast. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Over here. Thank you, Mr. Palmek, for your work. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist, and sometimes I'm in the habit of prescribing a book to one of my patients, and so. Just tell them not to read after uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> well, I prescribed the Museum of Innocence Thank to, you. to a 40-year-old black janitor from here in town. Mm -hmm. He read it, and it was the most effective um, interpretation I, I have made. So Maybe we should put that the, as a blurb on the front cover. <laughs> You're welcome to it. Thank you. I, uh, from reading your book, sort of was inspired to start writing, um, not very successfully so far. But I was wondering if you believe, um, is a great writer born with the talent, or is it possible to learn that talent and learn that um, craftsmanship? This is a um, provocative question. Of course, you don't do that. That, uh, that you, I've always been asked, Mr. Pamuk, do you believe in creative writing departments? Do you think writer, uh, writing can be taught? I think some of it is possible that you learn. There's so much to learn. Reading books is the first thing you do to be a writer. Then the rest, really, just life. Just like life depends on your cleverness, on your luck, on your persistence, on your strength, on, your, on this and on that. Can we say that? Because there is a uh, university of life that will teach us those who go to university of life will be more successful in life. It's like that. But on the other hand, there, is, there are books, if you read them, you have more chance of being successful. Thank you. Over here. Merhaba, Ohlan Bey. I just got back from spending a year teaching English in Ankara, uh -huh. um, and there are a few times in classes when my students would not speak, and there were three things that I could always count on to make them speak with each other. One was Taip Erdogan, one was soccer, and one was you. Um, <laughs> the typical response I got from my students, this was at Bill Kent University, was that you were somehow a non, uh, anti-Turkish or non-Turkish for what you said about uh, what's happened in the history with Turkey and, Ar and Armenia um, and that you were pandering to the West in the statements that you've made, I, I believe, to a Swiss paper. I wanted to know, does it bother you to be seen in that light? Of course it bothers everyone to be seen that way and it's not, it's not a joking matter. I understand, I'm sorry that those students of yours are uh, thinking uh, that way. But don't forget that the, that totes, um, newspapers, governments, armies, um, big money, um, published newspapers, controlled media, and those ideas passed to, I would say, young, naive minds like that. 
uh, people don't think those things, and they are unfortunately very supp uh, suppressive, oppressive, right-wing nationalist ideas. They learn, these good boys learn those bad ideas from bad newspapers who are spreading a sort of fas uh, uh, extravagant right-wing fascistic ideas. I can't help it, but, uh, but just don't think of this situation as an eternal. It's politics is like that, that someone in the streets that you don't know has bad ideas about you which are not true and accurate. Of course I'm sorry about that, but then I cannot shut up my mind because some cheap newspaper will write something bad about me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Palmer, um, the only work, unfortunately, of yours that I have read is Snow, and um, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, but I, uh, reading about the, Turk, the present Turkish government and what is going on, particularly uh, a recent article I read about somehow the Muslims, uh, well, the Muslim government has taken over the judiciary, I think about Snow uh, and what did Orhan Pamuk uh, say in Snow, which uh, it, it kind of reminded me. It, it, I get the feeling, based on what I read in Snow, that somehow the military is going to take over the government, uh, that the military uh, you know, was in, um, uh, opposed to the, uh, the Muslim uh, influences in Turkey during the time of Snow. And uh, I don't know, is, uh, what is the situation now? I'm asking you a political question. Uh, uh, I don't think this is a, even a political, this is a journalistic question you're asking, sir. All right. What is the situation there now? <laughs> well, the, it's sunny. All right, uh, <laughs> last, yeah, last time I was there, it was not raining. But of course, we writers should avoid being journalistic representatives of our cultures, of our countries. If I attempt to see the nation spirit rather than the latest political developments, I don't think there is a major political drama happening in Turkey now. I, I think it's just normal. I have seen my, I know my country. It's just regular politics are happening. What happened in the last 10 years after 9-11 was that uh, that Turkey is in the news because of America's worries about Islamic world, call it Islamophobia, or America's um, defense about, uh, against Islamic terrorism, whatever you may call it. Because of that, Turkey is in the news. But if you look at it from my point of view, nothing much had changed, but it's on the news and you're asking me about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to say we only have time for one more question, and you're it, sir. Thank you. Uh, Pamuk Bey, uh, do you have any thoughts about passing on the weight of your works to sorry? your daughter? Do you have any thoughts about passing on the weight of your works to your daughter? Oh, I see. Yeah, but then I'm, I'm, I'm not a closet writer. She knows that I'm a writer. She reads my books. My father was a sort of a shy poet who just did not want me to read his poems and was, uh, was also uh, thoroughly self-conscious about his failure, but that you can't even call it a failure because he didn't uh, too want it too I much. Think. So there's a difference. Um, uh, for my daughter, I am an outspoken writer. Um, I am a writer who is obviously there. It's not the same thing. All right, thank you. Thank you to Orhan Pamuk for the wonderful interview. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.